Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar, Applying the Latest Research to Prevent Bullying, Empowering Schools to Change Behavior and Attitudes, hosted by the National Institute of Justice. At this time, I'm going to go ahead and turn over the presentation to Mary. Good morning, everyone. Um, good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, and let me also extend my welcome to the webinar today. Uh, my name is Mary Poole Carlton. I work at the National Institute of Justice, and I'm pleased that you've chosen to join us for this webinar that's co-sponsored by NIJ and the Federal Partners in Bullying Prevention. Um, much of NIJ's recent investments in bullying research come from our comprehensive school safety initiatives, and we're going to hear from two researchers this afternoon who have worked um, to help advance our understanding of what works to prevent and respond to bullying. Um, they're going to deliver um, two presentations. Um, I will help field a discussion with some questions um, between the two researchers at the end. And then um, everyone in the audience will have an opportunity to ask questions, um, as Mary Jo just mentioned earlier. So please um, feel free to keep track of those questions as we're proceeding and submit them. Um, and we will um, ask those questions of our panelists. So um, let me take just a few moments to briefly introduce each of our panelists, and we will get started. Um, first, Presenting is uh, Tracy Wasdorp, who is a senior research scientist at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia Center for the Study and Prevention of Violence. Um, tr followed by Tracy, we will have Amanda Nickerson, um, who is professor and director of the Alberti Center for Bullying Abuse Prevention at the University at Buffalo. Um, as I mentioned just a moment ago, I will be um, holding a discussion at the end of our se session. I will be um, fielding some questions um, from myself but, and also those from Christina Weeder from the Kentucky Department of Education who unfortunately was not able to join us this afternoon. Um, but I am pleased that we are ready to get started with, this, with the webinar and I would like to turn things over to, to Tracy to talk about her work. Tracy. My name is Tracy. Tracy Wasdorp, and I am a research scientist at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, formerly the Violence Prevention Initiative, and now the Center for Study and Prevention of Violence. I first just want to thank my co-developers of the program I'm going to be discussing today, Dr. Katherine Bradshaw and Dr. Elise Poss. Um, this project was funded by the National Institute of Justice and it was awarded to University of Virginia, Johns Hopkins, and Shepard Pratt. I want to also thank the developers of two of the programs that we used to adapt to create this bullying-focused program, uh, the CCU and Teach Live. I also want to thank our coaches who helped with the implementation of our first pilot. So just so we're on, all on the same page, why are we focusing on bullying? First, the definition. Bullying is a form of aggression where the individual is repeatedly exposed to negative actions on the part of one or more other persons. It often occurs when there is a power or status difference. We know that bullying has far-reaching mental health, behavioral, and academic impacts for both the victim and the perpetrator. But we also know that it negatively impacts the bystanders, those who witness it, and the school climate in general. In a study that looked at the differences between student and staff perceptions of bullying, 43% of students reported that they witnessed adults watching bullying and doing nothing, whereas 97% of teachers say that they would have intervened. 60% believe that adults at their school are not doing enough to prevent bullying, whereas the teachers felt that they have effective strategies for handling bullying. And finally, 61% believe that the teachers who tried to stop the bullying only made it worse, whereas only 7% of the teachers felt that they made it worse. So there's a high prevalence of bullying in schools. And we also know that students have more opportunity, given they spend more time, to experience bullying in the classroom. So teachers are in the front lines of intervention but we know that students rarely report bullying to teachers. In a sample of, of, of over 69,000 middle and high school youth, 
only 5.5% told an adult at school when they were the victim of bullying. Studies that um, look at bullying prevention programming found that consistent discipline, classroom management, class rules specifically related to bullying, and the training of teachers are all aspects of effective programming. However, we know that teachers often struggle to detect and intervene with bullying. So we found that non-response, delayed response, or ineffective responses worsen the situation. We did some focus groups prior to starting the study, and we found that many of the students felt that teachers just don't care about bullying. And teachers reported that they had a lot of difficulty discriminating between typical peer conflict and bullying. Both students and teachers felt there wasn't enough time in the day to address the bullying. And the students interpret that lack of time that teachers have into not caring about bullying. These, fo these focus group findings help us decide what this program needed to focus on and how much time this program could take. We knew that teachers did not feel that they had the time to do it, but we knew that students wanted to feel that adults cared. So we wanted to help teachers to focus on their relationships with their students. Students needed to know that while teachers may not have the time, they do care. We needed to open the communication between students and teachers regarding their peer relationships. And importantly, we needed to help teachers shift from simple behavioral responses to an SEL, or social emotional learning focused response, to stop treating bullying as a disruptive behavior. It's not. Instead, validate the student's emotions, their experiences, use modeling, and take students' perspectives, which I'll get into. So we designed the Bullying Classroom Checkup, the BCCU. Its focus is on, this is a conceptual model where we have detection, responding, and bullying prevention all being supported through teacher-student relationships, positive behavior supports, and the classroom climate. So we adapted the classroom checkup, which is a coaching model, and a teaching Teach Live Mixed Reality Simulator to provide teachers with guided practice and feedback, all to focus on bullying. We also used um, psychoeducational component of the bullying bulletins. These were pieces of paper that we handed out to the teacher that provided some additional information regarding bullying. So we first focused on detecting bullying. We wanted to educate teachers about bullying. They were allowed to practice detecting bullying in the simulator, which I will show you an example of what the simulator is in a little bit. We wanted to promote monitoring and data-based decision-making. We helped teachers to develop their classroom management strategies, such as active supervision. And we really focused on fostering relationships and trust so students help teachers to know what's happening. So some examples that we would give teachers to help fostering the student relationship through our coaching, we would tell them to give regular, non-contingent, positive interactions and show that they care. Let the students get to know you, and you should get to know your students. Give the students a voice and get to know and share with families, not just when something's negative, when things are positive too. So one of the things we had in our guide for teachers was to observe students and acknowledge when they might be having a bad day or problem and let students know you are there to help or talk. For preventing bullying, we had effective classroom management as a focus. We target positive behavioral supports that include a specific focus on social behaviors, setting, teaching, and reinforcing, reinforcing expectations related to peer relationships in your classroom. So the focus is on building teacher and student relationships as well as student and student relationships. And to focus on making your instruction engaging and well paced, taking note of higher risk times that bullying can occur. Some examples of prevention that we provide for the teachers is to set, to set and display clear expectations regarding positive social behaviors. This should be done at the start of the year and strategically throughout, such as right after a school break to reinforce positive social interactions and model appropriate behavior. So we tell teachers to draw attention to positive peer behaviors occurring, label the specific positive interaction. 
I like what I just saw between Jesse and Sarah, even though it seemed you guys did not agree about that project. You worked it out respectfully. Or, I really like how you included Jake into your group. You guys are working together really well. Next, we focus on responding to bullying using the social-emotional learning responses. We really included a strong focus on validating how the students feel, their emotions, their experiences, modeling appropriate responses, and putting yourself in their shoes. We wanted teachers to have open discussions with the whole class about bullying and about their expectations, but also have separate conversations individually with the perpetrator and the victim. We also wanted the teachers to identify consequences for obvious bullying and implement those consequences very consistently. Some examples of responding that we worked with teachers on. So we gave them handouts on what they can do to detect bullying in your classroom. We also gave some information on ways in which to discuss bullying with the perpetrator after class or the victim. And we also talked about how to set consistent consequences for clear bullying behavior. So some of the things we would tell teachers to discuss would be to indicate you want to help, and we'll discuss the situation with each student privately outside of the classroom time. Something like, I did not see what happened here, but it looks like it's frustrating for both of you. I would really like to know what, more about what happened. Let's set up a meeting outside of class so I can talk separately to you both. Or if you see somebody that was uh, saying something mean and then said, oh, I'm only kidding, you could say, I know he said he was only kidding, but I would be here if someone said something like that to me. Well, I don't know the whole situation. It did not seem respectful to me. I'm here if you want to talk later. One of the things we found were teachers were saying they did not see the whole thing, and we felt it was important that teachers recognize they did not see it, and therefore they do want to help, they just don't know, and they're open to finding out. So this is the Bullying Classroom Checkup, the BCCU model. I'm not going to go into depth on each step, but um, briefly we had the coach do a motivational interview and introduce the bullying framework. And they, the, te the coach then class observes the classroom and provides personalized feedback for the teacher. They have goals related specifically to the social interactions in the classroom and the teacher's social interactions with the children. And there's collaborative problem solving and goal setting. I want you to take note of step four, which is where we start doing the guided practice, which is where they get to practice preventing detection and responding in the live simulator. That I'm going to show you now. So this is a mixed reality simulator. You can see here, these are the characters that the teachers will see. And on the right, you can see that it shows you that if you move forward, the program actually acknowledges that and the kids will get closer. And it actually is um, working in real time with what the teachers are experiencing. So what is a simulator? It's mixed reality. There are scripted parts to it, so we can make sure that the kids are, in fact, displaying bullying behaviors. It's a small classroom of these five students responding in real time. So while there is a script, if the teacher says something, those kids respond to specifically what that teacher says. It was developed as a tool for training pre-service teachers. And the participants are, in our case, the teachers as well as sometimes peer teachers that sit in with them in the coaching session in the simulator, um, follow the session and learn throughout. So you can see here it's on a screen. Here we're showing um, people how this works. This is the five kids sitting in the classroom. And here you can see a teacher practicing. They have a um, something on their face that gathers the sound and they can hear the kids and they can talk directly to the children. You can see some peer teachers in the background and they can all learn from each other through the experience. So we wanted to trial this BCCU and this was a teacher randomized controlled trial with 80 middle school teachers in five schools. And a brief summary of the results, we found that 100% of teachers agree that they should intervene with bullying but 86% of them felt that they could benefit from coaching to improve how they address bullying. 
the coach teachers were more likely to recognize that adults at the school are not doing enough to address bullying. We also found that the BCCU was very low burden and it only required four hours of active teacher's time in order to go through the program. The results showed that we had improved teachers' reports of responding to and improved the detection of bullying. They were more likely to witness all forms of bullying. They were more likely to talk to other staff, refer to a guidance counselor, and intervene with both the perpetrator and the victim when they saw bullying. We had outside observers of each classroom, and they were not more likely to tally aggressive behavior in the classroom pre to post. So we found that it was, in fact, the teachers um, detecting the behavior. So some take-home concepts for um, our program is to focus on understanding the roles of bullying. All involved should be focused. We found that many teachers would just focus on the perpetrator and quickly say, hey, so-and-so, stop that behavior, but no mention of the victim was made. They wanted the behavior to stop, and that was the goal. Um, we also found that um, no, no mention of bystanders was, was given. So we wanted to really reinforce that all people involved should be a focus for teachers. And one of the big aha moments for teachers was to notice the victims and say something to the victims like, I'm sorry, you're hurt. Just a quick recognition of that models the appropriate behavior. We also wanted to highlight the forms of aggression and bullying. So while the program is for bullying, we tell our teachers to focus on the, any forms of aggression that they see and that could lead to bullying. We also found that um, certain behaviors teachers would not even acknowledge as bullying and it would just be a behavioral infraction. So in our simulator, we, we had every single teacher saw a child pull out a cell phone, post a picture verbally and say, and clearly harm another child's reputation who is sitting right next to her. And in every single case, the teacher would just ask the child to put the phone away, and not one person mentioned the harm that that child just caused. So we really wanted to shift teachers' focus on it being behavioral, and notice that there are many different roles that these children play. It's also important to recognize that sometimes children are reactive, and they are not necessarily the uh, aggressor in that moment, but they may look like it. So not knowing what happened even though you might know that that child's usually the aggressor, not going in with that idea and saying you don't know what happened, but you do want to know more for behaviors that are ambiguous. So we also found that when teachers hear about the more covert behaviors, such as um, leaving children out, excluding, they were more likely to notice them and recognize them as bullying. For example, I've had a teacher that said, uh, there was a child that used to come into the classroom and give gifts only to certain children in the classroom, purposely leaving out others, but it wasn't disruptive. That's the kind of behavior a teacher could model that it's not appropriate and why. Um, it's also important for teachers to remember that social relationships are very important to children. So telling them to leave the problems outside the classroom so you can focus on academics is extremely difficult for them. It's like when we have a bad day at work and we have to leave it at work. It's not that easy for children to do this. It's also important that we are positive bystanders as adults, that we know when a child's agitating us and how we should respond as well. And it's also important to seek appropriate help when necessary. Refer the children to people that can help them if you don't feel that you can help. Do not wait until the, programs, the, till the problems escalate. So how is the BCCU different? It's fully teacher-focused. It's not student-focused. It emphasizes classroom management as a large portion of it, as well as teacher social-emotional learning capacity. It balances the need to address bullying as well as covering academic content simultaneously. We train teachers to respond to bullying, to prevent bullying, and detect bullying without increasing the burden on their time. And we provide guided practice using the mixed reality simulation. This helps them learn these skills in an accelerated fashion. And it helps promote the uptake. It's a pretty cool experience to go in there and talk to these children and have them respond to you in real time and practice skills that you don't want to practice on real life children in case you mess them up, especially in the instance of bullying. It also allows for building muscle memory. 
so um, teachers can practice these things and it can become more instinctual to them so then they can do them in the classroom. We had teachers after the uh, intervention tell us that they actually felt after their sessions that they had a relationship with these five kids. The kids have personalities and all the scripts that are created go along with these children's personalities. So you do get to know them just like the ch teachers do their own children. So some future directions for the BCCU, we want to examine it with a larger 40 school trial, not randomizing by teachers, but randomizing at the school level. And we want to focus on late elementary school. Uh, logistically, it's the same teacher the entire day. And um, we also wanted to expand our psychoeducational component. We designed six PDs that uh, will get the, the entire school will be able to receive the um, content of the program, not the entire program, but much of the content. And we're also going to be gathering student self-report data. Recently, uh, in Pennsylvania, schools were seeking PDs and certification for bullying. And um, in discussions with people, it turned out that schools have picked a program, a student-focused program for changing bullying. And uh, when PDs were actually the desired um, program, but there are no evidence-based programs that are standalone PDs. And, um, so one of the things we'd like to do is to do a trial that actually assesses our PDs versus others to, so, so we could have an evidence-based PD for addressing bullying and certification for this. And finally, the use of the Teach Live technology could be expanded to assist bystanders to know how to intervene in bullying or the victims of bullying how to respond to bullying situations. I again want to just bring up my co-collaborators my co uh, for the program, Elise Poss and Catherine Bradshaw. These are two manuscripts related to the BCCU that are out there now. And recently, uh, Catherine Bradshaw and I wrote a book on, that used a lot of these concepts discussing social-emotional learning approach to preventing bullying, and it's available on Amazon currently. So I am going to pass on the presentation to Amanda Nickerson, Right now. Hi. Thank you. Hi. Thank you so much, Tracy. Before we move on to Amanda, we got a couple um, clarifying questions that I would love to ask you now before we move to the second presentation. Okay. Uh, so the first question that we got gets at um, understanding what bullying is. And um, I know you touched on defining bullying at the outset, but could you Pardon me, could you explain a little bit more about what the difference is between a typical peer conflict and bullying? Yeah, I think one of the biggest defining features is that the power status and um, that it's a negative behavior that was done on purpose. And I think that those, it's really important to recognize that. So two friends of equal footing who are having um, a fight, that's a conflict. Whereas when you have a child who literally cannot come up with a way to get out of that situation because of the person who's doing its power, that makes it bullying. So if both people could come up with solutions to the problem, that's a conflict. And I think okay. just to mention the repeated nature, I think when, um, in general, you want the behavior to be repeated. Sometimes in, in the research world, we'll say two or more times a month. I think with, uh, with cyberbullying, it becomes the intent to be repeated or it could be repeated one text could be seen numerous times, so that would be counting as uh, repeated as well. Okay, thank you. Um, and one more question, um, and this relates to the Teach Live um, and thinking about student behavior or teachers' behavior before participating with Teach Live or the BCCU um, and afterwards. I'm wondering, can you give an example of how? Um, teacher behavior um, has changed or common ways that teacher behavior has changed before and after participating in the program? Yeah, I think one of the, one of the most interesting things to see was children, they started, we tell the teachers to just start teaching a lesson and we tell them to teach it on homophones, for example. So they start teaching their lesson and the first time they do it, um, the, the children are scripted to specifically show bullying behaviors, and oftentimes the teacher's like, I just got to get through this content. That's what I was told to do. So once we've raised the awareness, hey, 
why don't, did you notice these things? Can you detect them? It starts raising the awareness that, okay, I should also see these things going on. And secondarily, to focus on the victims was something that was, as we were told from the teachers, they, they said an aha moment where they realized it made such a difference um, to focus on not just stopping the behavior, but recognizing what the behavior is and helping out the children. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, okay. With that, um, we will move to our second presenter, Amanda Nickerson. Amanda? Okay, thank you so much. And uh, I really appreciate Tracy's presentation. And although we're focusing on uh, different topics here as she's focusing on the teachers in the environment, I think there's quite a bit of, of overlap. And I think you'll see um, points of connection as well. So I'm going to be talking about bystander intervention in bullying. Um, so we've definitely used that term bystander uh, previously in uh, the webinar. So I'm going to go into a little bit more depth about what that is and uh, what we know about uh, students that engage in this behavior, this so-called defending behavior. Um, so my goal is really to identify the roles of youth that they have in so-called bullying interactions. Um, so besides the victim and the perpetrator, what are the other roles that students may play? Um, I'm then going to talk about some of our work uh, that's, that's operationalizing what bystander intervention looks like in bullying. Um, and this may be familiar to some of you from uh, back in your college days when you took a social psychology class because some of this um, has been around for a while and we're now just applying it to the field of bullying. Uh, so we'll also talk a bit about the individual and situational variables that predict this bystander intervention. And then finally, I'll talk about some of our current um, and, and future ongoing work um, that's really getting more into implementing this and the implications of, of teaching this bystander intervention approach as part of a larger uh, bullying prevention and intervention initiatives. So let's start by talking a bit about bullying roles. And this goes back to Dan Olveus uh, in Norway and then Christina Salma Valley uh, in Finland has really told us a lot about the bullying dynamic and the roles that students can play in, uh, in a bullying interaction. So Roughly speaking, and prevalence rates definitely vary, about 20 to 30 percent of students, uh, children and adolescents, are involved in bullying as either a perpetrator, a victim, or both. Um, we've seen some declines over time in reported bullying victimization, which is very good news, um, but it still is quite a prevalent problem. But that's not the whole story when we look at bullying. We know that most of the time when bullying occurs, there's other people that are seeing, hearing, witnessing what's going on. So we refer to them as bystanders. You know, I think traditionally a bystander is thought of as someone that's more apathetic and really isn't taking much of a role. But Christina Salma Valley and others have really pointed out that these bystanders or witnesses or observers can engage in actions that either reinforce enforce the bullying, so our so-called assistants or reinforcers that are encouraging the bullying implicitly or explicitly saying that this is okay, laughing, um, getting involved physically. Uh, we also have outsiders, which are those that, that don't really report being aware of it or involved, or they're just more likely to ignore when it happens. And then we've got a group of defenders, and this is where my work has, has focused quite a bit in trying to better understand those youth that that engage in a wide variety of behaviors to try to stop the bullying, either directly or indirectly. So by indirectly, I mean reporting it to a trusted adult um, or directly confronting the bully, um, uh, kind of collecting themselves with other peers that can uh, intervene more safely. Um, and importantly, which I will touch on a bit more, is 
is reaching out directly to the target and supporting them in, in some way. Before I move on, it is really important to note that there is fluidity in these roles. So although some of our research has categorized students uh, into these different roles, um, my colleague Lindsay Jenkins at uh, Florida State University has done some work in this area, finding that there's quite a bit of overlap. So in more person-centered or latent class approaches, finding that uh, students, uh, a large proportion of them are moderately involved in multiple roles. We also have the defenders that have also been victimized themselves. We also have individuals that are aggressive themselves and defend and are victimized and just high involvement across. So I do think that that's important to point out, even though some of the research I'm going to be going over um, is looking at people that are more likely to defend. I think that dynamic is, is important to consider. So why are bystander reactions important? Um, we know that those peers that are assisting and reinforcing that bullying um, sends the message to the perpetrator that um, this is reinforcing or it rewards them. It gives them power and attention, which we know is quite motivating for most perpetrators. In contrast, if someone is defending or doing something to stop it or intervene, that's providing negative feedback to the perpetrator. And there's also growing evidence that when there are peers that defend um, the, the target, that it makes them feel less anxious and depressed. So it can be helpful from both the aspect of giving less attention to that perpetrator, but also reducing the negative impact of the bullying on the target if it does occur. So the magic question, why don't more bystanders intervene? Um, so some of our classic observational research done by uh, Wendy Craig and uh, Deb Pepler and others in Canada have found that although peer bystanders are present more than 80% of the time in bullying episodes, they intervene less than 20% of the time. Um, so from Tracy's presentation, we know that students report that the same thing is happening with teachers, that there, there's a lot of witnessing, a lot of others being present, but not as much intervention. Um, and some of the reasons for that are similar to what we know about the bystander effect um, from social psychology research from long ago, and some is a little bit more unique. Um, but one thing we know is that if others are present and aren't doing anything, that we have this diffusion of responsibility, this idea, well, if no one else is doing anything, then why should I be the one to do that? There's other people that could take an active role and they're not. Another very pertinent one when we um, speak to youth about this is fear of retaliation. You know, if you are the one that intervenes, that's quite a risk. Then you could then become um, the, the next target. And unfortunately, we do know that this does happen from time to time. Another concept that comes into play is uh, pluralistic ignorance. Um, the idea that, again, if other people around us are seeing and hearing this and they're not doing anything, then they must think that it's okay. Um, so I'll talk in a bit about uh, some of the current work we're doing in trying to shift those beliefs and social norms and attitudes of youth. And then last, unfortunately, one of the things we also find is some blaming of the victim and this kind of just world hypothesis, the idea that if this is happening, if someone's being bullied, well, they must have got what was coming to them. You know, maybe uh, people view this child as, as annoying and say, well, you know, maybe this will teach them a lesson. So this is a phenomenon that we see and hear from youth. So as I said, one of my real interests is in what we know about this, uh, this group of defenders. And again, it's not this homogeneous group, um, but of people whose peers and themselves say, I'm more likely to defend um, than, than others. What do we know about them? First is that they generally have a pretty high social status. 
So they are uh, fairly secure in their social network. They may be more popular, um, well-regarded by their peer group, um, kind of puts them in a position where they could take this risk, whereas peers that are more rejected or perhaps more isolated may not have that social status to be able to intervene. We also know that social skills are important, but not all of them and not all of them in the same way. Um, so, for instance, some of the work that, that we've done has found that assertion, um, that, that social skill of being able to stand up and, and interject is important. Interestingly, we found an inverse relationship between cooperation and defending. So, in other words, those who report being less cooperative are more likely to defend. And you know, it wasn't what we expected at first, but in thinking more about it, it made a lot of sense because, again, there is some amount of risk and some amount of, of standing up to people that is, is going to disrupt being more cooperative and, and complacent, um, if you will. Empathy, again and again, has been um, closely correlated to defending. Uh, so I've conducted a meta-analysis of the relationship between empathy and uh, defending or bystander intervention and found a moderate correlation of about 0.31 to 0.33, depending um, on, on the way that we were looking at studies. But the message is not all positive. Uh, we also have some emerging research that is showing that those that are more likely to defend are also more likely to have internalizing problems such as depression and anxiety. It's as of now, uh, unclear, I believe, whether or not it's that depression and anxiety that's helping to feed that defending, as in, you know, this is making me anxious and depressed and therefore I'm going to intervene, or if it's once someone intervenes um, that that could then lead them to have more internalizing problems, or it quite, um, it quite possibly may be a bi-directional relationship. And we do have some evidence that defenders do have an increased likelihood of being victimized. So going back to that fear of retaliation, there definitely is something to that. And I think we've got to be really careful um, in educating our, our students about that, as well as our teachers. So Tracy did a fabulous job of talking about how we need our teachers to really be empathic and intervene and see and hear things and send the message that they are the adults in the environment and they do care. So sometimes when I talk about bystander intervention, I get the question of, well, how can you expect the peers to do it when adults don't do it? And don't we need to care about how others respond? And my question, my answer to that would be absolutely. Um, but this is just giving the skills to our youth um, that hopefully they'll be able to use in the present and in later life. I just want to make a note that the context, the peer group influence, and relationships really matter in defending. So in some situations, someone's going to be more likely to defend if it's a close friend of theirs that this is happening to. Um, and we, we see that again and again, but need to do more research on that. So what is this process of bystander intervention? So thinking towards intervention and how to teach this, I was really passionate about breaking it down into sequential steps that we could really teach um, to students. And again, looking to the social psychology literature from Latine and Darley back in the 70s, who found this bystander effect, they identified a five-step process that people need to go through in emergency situations in order to provide help. So the steps, uh, according to Latine and Darley, were first, we had to notice that there was a problem or an event or an emergency. Next, that event needed to be interpreted as an emergency that required help. Third, and importantly, we needed to assume responsibility for helping, so kind of getting over that pluralistic ignorance or diffusion of responsibility to say, yes, it is my right and responsibility to do this. People have to know what to do or how to help, and then finally act to provide the help. 
So some of our earlier work in this area took this five-step model and applied it to bullying and sexual harassment. Um, so uh, my colleagues and I developed a, a measure um, that was really trying to operationalize this five-step model and apply it. Um, in this particular study with 562 high school students, we were applying it to bullying and sexual harassment. So the noticing uh, were things like, I'm aware that bullying and sexual harassment happen at my school. I've seen this happen. Interpreting it is that, you know, this can hurt someone's feelings. Um, this is hurtful and damaging. Taking responsibility were questions like, um, if I'm not the one doing the bullying harassment, it's still my responsibility to try to stop it. Knowing how to help is, you know, I have the skills to be able to support a student who's being bullied or harassed. And then acting is, I would say, do something to a student who's acting mean or disrespectful to a more vulnerable student. So we uh, did confirmatory factor analysis and then also structural equation modeling to see um, how well this five-factor model held up and how well the steps um, held together. Um, and it did show that through confirmatory factor analysis that this five-factor structure worked, if you will, that our subscales were internally consistent. Um, and in our future, um, in our work after that original study, we've done more more with um, measurement equ equivalence and validating this measure in middle school populations and late elementary school populations as well. You will notice if you can see the small numbers there in the uh, structural equation modeling that with each successive step, the correlations get higher. And I'll talk about that a little bit more when I talk about some of our intervention work. Um, I think that unlike the Latine and Darley model with emergencies where the noticing is a specific event that you would notice that someone had fallen down or were hurt in some way, that we were looking more globally at whether or not bullying and sexual harassment were issues. Um, so I think that has something to do with, with why that's not holding together quite as well as some of the other steps. So we and, and others, um, notably my colleague Lindsay Jenkins, who I've mentioned at Florida State University, um, have done a series of studies to look at what predicts, um, you know, in contrast to our previous work on what predicts defending, how can we really look at each of these five steps and see what may predict that? Um, interestingly, and as I said before, that noticing step seems to be a little bit unique, um, we found that victimized youth and also those with lower social status were actually more likely to notice the bullying. Um, so again, we had hypothesized that um, that that wouldn't be the case, that those that were kind of higher in social status and less likely to be rejected would notice it happening more since it was the first step. But in reflecting on this, it actually makes a lot of sense that someone that has experienced this personally is going to be more likely to notice it happening. In terms of interpreting it as a problem, um, we found, as expected, that victimized boys were more likely to interpret bullying as an emergency or a problematic situation. Very interestingly, we found the opposite for girls. So in other words, girls that were more likely, um, were less likely to be victimized, were more likely to interpret it as a problem. And, you know, I have some hypotheses about this, and maybe in the, the question and answer we can talk more about this, and I'd be interested, since Tracy's done quite a bit of work in relational aggression, too, to, to hear her thoughts. Um, in terms of empathy, we found that boys in particular that lacked affective empathy were less likely to interpret bullying as a problem or an emergency. Um, empathy for boys also um, predicted uh, having them uh, see it as a, as it's their responsibility to intervene. So boys that had more empathy were more likely to see it as their responsibility. Those with less were less likely to see it as their responsibility. 
In terms of knowing what to do, another very interesting gender finding um, in that girls who ignored bullying um, responded as we expected, that they were, they also said, you know, I don't know as much about how to intervene, um, therefore I, I'm ignoring it. We found the opposite for boys, in that boys who ignored bullying reported that they actually knew more um, about how to intervene that bo than boys that didn't ignore. Um, so we're interpreting that in part to think that the boys may have some of these skills, but there's other social forces at play that are inhibiting them from, from wanting to intervene. And then finally, in the actions, um, boys with less affective empathy were less likely to intervene. And as I mentioned previously, um, those were with internaling, internalizing problems, um, uh, we've actually found that that can inhibit youth from intervening even if they have the skills to do so. Um, so the work on internalizing uh, problems and defending still needs a lot more development to, to really understand what's going on there. So is bystander intervention effective? Um, we do know from early observational studies that when bystanders intervene, it uh, stops the victimization about half of the time. Some people think that's pretty good. Some people think, ooh, that's not, that's a 50-50 chance. You know, that, that's not that, that great. Um, we also know that bystander intervention and defending behavior decreases the frequency of bullying in classrooms, and it's associated with a higher reported sense of safety among students. In a meta-analysis of uh, bystander intervention programs, um, interestingly, and in contrast to what we know about bullying prevention more generally, these bystander intervention programs were more effective at the high school level with an effect size of 0.43 versus with younger students at the elementary age where the effect size was 0.14. Um, I'm going to talk just briefly about some current work um, and obviously recognize the National Institute of Justice for their support of this and the principal investigator of this study, Dr. Richard Gilman. Um, for a disclosure, I am a consultant on this grant, um, but I am not the principal investigator. Um, so what we're doing with this work is um, identifying and training uh, third, sixth, and ninth grade student brokers. So how we identify these brokers is through um, peer ratings and nominations. And what we're doing is really looking for students who have relationships to other peers that aren't related to each other. So they have more diffuse kind of social connections and groups. Um, the reason we're targeting them is that we think that they're more likely to take the skills that they're, that they're taught and, and diffuse them throughout a wider network. So uh, each year there's about 25 to 30 students um, per each of these grades um, that get bystander intervention training and full disclosure, they do get that from me. Um, and that involves uh, really teaching and practicing those five steps of the bystander intervention model. And we do it through videos and role plays and discussions of kind of each of the, we talk about what bullying is and how it's differentiated from conflict and, and other other sorts of relational issues. Um, and I, I did want to emphasize that the multiple options for intervening is really important. So I'm not going to read all those, but as I mentioned before, that um, we want people to have safe, effective options for intervening um, in a way that's going to work with the social skills um, that they have and, uh, you know, within their context. These uh, individuals, these students, um, met twice a month with, with their counselor and peers and went through the bully-proofing curriculum um, and also did sort of more of um, outreach and advocacy around um, bystander intervention, so kind of training other students and having campaigns and things like that. So our preliminary findings are that a year after, so this is actually the 
following school year after these students were trained um, that the students in the intervention condition compared to students who didn't receive the intervention. Um, so we used ANCOVA analyses with these so we could control for their baseline scores in each of these five steps of bystander intervention. Um, we found that they actually didn't differ significantly in noticing and interpreting bullying as a problem. Again, I just want to highlight that the noticing is really saying bullying is a problem in this school. So that may be part of why we, um, we didn't find that. Um, we did find that they had significantly higher self-reported scores of accepting responsibility, knowing what to do, and acting to intervene. We also have some more objective data in terms of the reported incidents. Um, and here we're looking at uh, bullying as well as inappropriate and cruel teasing. And we're seeing across three years, the baseline year, the intervention year one, and intervention year two. Um, and we'll see that the reports of inappropriate and cruel teasing um, really reduced dramatically. Um, the bullying uh, did as well, particularly after that first intervention year, and then it really seemed to level off at year two. And I just want to also mention um, some of the other current work that I'm doing is um, through a recently awarded grant through the Institute of Education Sciences. Um, it's a development and in uh, innovation grant. So my team and I are working on developing and testing an intervention that combines a social norms campaign approach, so going back to what it is that we believe about uh, other students, their attitudes towards bullying, their attitudes towards bystander intervention, and trying to shift the needle and getting more students to see that, um, that others care about this issue as well. Um, and we're combining that. So the first year is really focusing on the social norms campaign development and testing. And the second year is focusing on the bystander intervention training of select students um, in high school. Uh, for the third year of the grant, we will combine the intervention because really the social norms campaign and bystander intervention training should go hand in hand. Um, I just have an example here of what a typical social norms campaign um, message might look like. Um, and I do just want to note that we still have quite a bit of ways to go in terms of understanding explicitly which bystander interventions are most effective in different situations. So given someone's relationship with a perpetrator, um, a target, other bystanders, what are the best strategies that they can use? Um, what about if it's bullying versus sexual harassment? Is that different? Um, and also, of course, things like cyberbullying. What does that really look like and what are the most uh, safe and effective ways uh, to intervene? So I just want to thank you so much for your interest and everyone listening who is making a difference. And I'm going to hand it um, back over to Mary, who is going to facilitate our question and answer session. Great. Thank you so much, Amanda. Um, I think we've had two um, really interesting presentations um, tackling bullying from two different perspectives. One, looking at um, teachers, how can we work with teachers to respond to bullying, and the other, looking at um, you know, a role that students may, may be able to play. So I think um, it's really helpful to think about those two different perspectives. Um, and so I want to kick off our discussion um, with a question or two for um, each of our presenters to consider. Um, and before I do that, I, I want to say thanks to everyone who's submitting questions. Please continue to do that. Um, and after I've had a chance to field um, a couple of questions, we're going to move on to questions from the audience. So again, please feel free um, to continue sending those in the Q&A. All right. Um, so Tracy and Amanda, so each of these approaches um, seem like that they'd be particularly helpful in addressing um, bullying behavior, you know, from these different perspectives, again, looking at the teachers, looking at the students. I'm wondering if you have um, any recommendations um, for school folks, um, school administrators, um, school districts, about um, what you've learned from your research and how to integrate 
um, that work into sort of into a more comprehensive approach to bullying prevention and intervention. Um, how you know schools that are doing doing bullying prevention and intervention, how could they add on to what they're doing now or replace given given your work and have a comprehensive um, you know top top line approach um, to preventing and addressing bullying behavior. Mm -hmm. Whoever wants to go first, if it's Tracy or Amanda. Uh, this is Amanda. Um, I'll go ahead and, and start with that. Um, I think it's a great question, and I, I think both Tracy and I would agree that neither of these approaches is uh, is intended to be the, the be-all uh, and end-all. Um, we do know that bullying prevention is an ongoing um, effort that takes comprehensive approaches, um, that having, you know, a clear policy that that folks are trained in and um, having appropriate responses when bullying happens, um, integrating more school-wide um, social emotional learning, positive behavior uh, interventions and supports, um, you know, partnering with parents. Those are all uh, critical components that through legislation and through, um, you know, best practice over time, I think more and more schools are, are implementing. Um, I I think as we as we progress in the field, we we learn more and more. Um, so we find that policies can be very effective or can be ineffective. And I think Tracy's work really shows how it, it's not enough to just she, the the schools pretty much all have policies, but if what's happening in the day-to-day -day in the adult response is not reflective of that policy, then that's where we really need more training in PD. Um, similarly, uh, there was a relatively recent meta-analysis by David Yeager and colleagues that was showing that our more typical bullying prevention approaches were not effective and even detrimental at the high school level. And a lot of the thinking was that we weren't really harnessing the power of the peers and where adolescents are in terms of their development in, in wanting to be more involved and having a say. So I think the work that, that Tracy and I are both doing are kind of advancing um, the field and and filling in some gaps where we know that there um, that there have been some missed opportunities, if you will. Thank you. Um, and I'll just add to that briefly that um, we have found that in a perfect world, you would want a universal program that has curricula from pre-K all the way to high school uh, to be implemented with perfect fidelity and as fully intended. However, that often is not the case because schools have many competing demands and social emotional is sometimes secondary to academic, which um, does make sense. However, uh, we've found that having champions in a school who really rally behind focusing on social emotional health of the students really makes an impact. And the more champions you have, the more impactful that will be. Um, I want to just mention a study that found that sometimes it can take up to three years before impacts on all the different forms of bullying are found. Um, so it's important for schools not to fall prey to the next new fad, the next new um, program, and possibly have continuity and in their programming across the years to try and really shift that change because change can be slow. Thank you. So, um, Tracy, you started getting at um, something that I was thinking of as a follow-up question to this comprehensive approach, and that is, um, you know, if schools want to move towards, you know, more comprehensive, effective approaches to bullying, I'm thinking about, you know, what, how intensive the resources might need to be, um, um, or uh, or support that schools might see, need to have to move to a more um, comprehensive, effective approach. You talked about sort of two issues um, that I'm wondering if you want to spend a little bit more time on or perhaps um, add to, and that is that it can take a lot of time for change. You talked about three years to get to strong implementation, and you also talked about having a champion at school, at the school. So I'm wondering, you know, both Tracy and Amanda, what kind of supports or knowledge um, or resources do you think that schools um, need to put in place or need to have access to and to, to really move into um, move to the direction that we want to 
than to go, given what we know now? Um, I think, like I said, I think that if schools have a focus on priority on social-emotional health of the students, that's going to be the first key and not, um, I think as schools are already moving in the direction of using evidence-based programs, that's going to be very important, but just merely buying the program is not enough, and I think that I've seen that many times in the schools where they purchase um, a program and then it's used piecemeal or it's picked up half, and I think that if, if schools would prioritize the social-emotional health for the teachers, and something that I think it was mentioned from between us prior to this, but about uh, pre-service teachers. So there's not a lot of focus on pre-service teachers and their ability to do these sort of behaviors. But if we could start there, if we could start having pre-service teachers learn how to handle social-emotional skills and improve their social-emotional skills, um, I think that that would be a good start as well. Okay, thank you. Um, Amanda, did you want to add anything? I think that was a great answer, so just ditto. Okay, great. Glad to hear it. Um, we're on the same page. Um, okay, so um, I'm starting to see some questions that are coming in that are similar to questions that um, we were thinking about as, as you all were presenting. So I'm going to start um, asking a couple of those questions. Um, and. The first question gets at um, the issue of cyberbullying. And one of the things that we know is that um, students today often interact frequently on social media. And I'm wondering um, the extent to which you're able to talk about um, the work and the research that you've all been doing and how applicable it might be um, to cyberbullying. Um, I mean, I don't know if Amanda wants to go, but um, for go us in particular with cyberbullying, we found that there's a very small proportion of children who only experience bullying in the cyber world. It's often the case that if they're experiencing in the cyber world, they're experiencing it outside of that world. So um, programming that addresses bullying in person, if you will, will also impact cyber. I think that there are different nuanced um, relationships that are different. I know, for example, the bystander in, um, there's probably likely more bystanders in a cyber situation than there are in a regular in-person situation. So I'm interested to hear what Amanda thinks about how bystander research and cyberbullying would shift. But I know that um, if we can help children deal with, this, gain the social emotional skills, have adults around them understand the social emotional skills and use them themselves, that should help with their use of the cyber technology to do this. Um, given that overlap with the forms. Yeah, I would agree with that, that the, the research is pretty clear that cyberbullying overlaps with many other um, forms of bullying. And so at the core, you know, some of the, the skills that are needed are very similar. Um, having said that, we, we do know that there are certainly um, nuances and some specific skills that, that may be needed both for cyberbullying prevention more generally and then also for bystander intervention in the cyber world. So, you know, teaching skills about digital citizenship and appropriate use of, of technology. It, it is a, a different world. Um, people will put post things that they would that they wouldn't say in person. Um, so I think a lot of our work and our scenarios in terms of the bystander intervention realm, we always bring in cyberbullying examples. And if we don't, the the kids or the counselors will. Um, and one of the things that I found most interesting in this is is really just focusing on the noticing and interpreting as a, it as a problem. So, for instance, um, this idea of roasting online where, you know, people will uh, kind of throw insults back and forth to each other um, meant to be in jest, but when so many people are seeing it and then it may hit um, – a, a sore spot for someone, you know, when does that cross the line to uh, to being more of a bullying situation? Um, I would say the other thing with, with bystander intervention online is that at least traditionally 
we've kind of advised that people don't get involved in in posting online because that can kind of spiral a situation, um, and particularly if the motive of the person engaging in the cyberbullying um, is more to uh, they're flaming or trolling or really trying to instigate and get a response that sometimes intervening to do something just escalates it. Um, so I think that we don't know all the answers yet about how that bystander intervention may look different in the cyber world, but um, I, I definitely think that there are some differences in that in terms of how public um, that sort of intervention is and um, still kind of going back to some of that need for face-to-face for -face if possible. Great. That, thank you so much. Um, and this is a, another question for both of you, um, but also sort of it gets on a theme that we're hearing from a number of folks who are su um, submitting some questions. And this gets um, at, the, um, at the issue of stakeholders um, or um, other folks who may play a role um, in response or in bullying prevention. So we know that um, bullying you know, often occurs outside of the classroom, like in the cyberbullying um, situation or places where there are less um, adult supervision. So I'm wondering um, beyond sort of students and, and teachers as stakeholders and responders to, um, to bullying prevention, um, are there ways that we could think about engaging parents or perhaps others um, in doing this work? And have you all done any research on either with the, the classroom checkup or with the bystander training? Um, that may um, allow us to give advice to, to some of these other stakeholders who might be interested in preventing or responding to bullying? Yeah, I mean, we haven't done any explicit research on um, parent involvement in terms of bystander intervention. We have certainly done research on um, parenting practices and um, parental responses to bullying and, and coping strategies. Um, I think that a very uh, real issue that, that we've faced in our work, and, and I know we're not alone um, with, other, with other schools, is, is uh, the, the best way to get that information to parents. Um, you know, I've done a lot of uh, parent sessions and things like that where they're fairly poorly attended, and the, mm. the parents that, that come are either those that really probably could have been doing the training themselves um, or their kids have have been victimized and they really are, are kind of looking for more individualized um, help with that. So I don't mean to be negative about it at all, and we certainly know from our meta-analyses that, that parent involvement um, is critical, but doing that on the, the preventive end I, I think is, is pretty challenging um, and that a lot of it has kind of come down to trying to communicate this information to parents either um, through letting them know what's happening with their child or through newsletters or, or online or, or things like that. And I know for our work, we are actually starting to um, ramp up our focus on that. We have a postdoc currently that's looking at parents' um, involvement with programming because I've seen in my own experience as well as um, in experiences in the schools that when you have the involved parents, it can really make a difference in terms of changing that climate outside of the school. So. I think some some of our colleagues are doing research where they've, um, I just read recently the text messaging research that's been doing for students. And I think that we need to start thinking outside the box about ways to reach parents. I know for me as a busy parent, um, reading a quick text message would be a lot easier than the 25 emails I get uh, a minute. So there could be other avenues that we could use technology to improve parents, even understanding what their children are learning in the school about SEL. I think I don't even get uh, a lot of information about that, uh, unless it's at 7 p.m. on a Tuesday night, I think that it would be nice to get it throughout um, my child's experience to learn about what they're learning for social, emotional, and then allow me to implement that at home as well. Thank you. Um, so a question from one of our audience members relates to the issue of bullying prevention and intervention um, 
and issues related to school climate and culture. So I'm wondering if um, either of you can speak to this issue of um, impacts of the work that, that you've done or that you know from other researchers on how um, bullying intervention, bullying prevention efforts um, may help address issues related to school climate and culture. Sure. Um, Do you want to start, Tracy? No, go ahead. Okay. Um, I was going to say we, we've both probably done, uh, I know we've both done work in yeah. this in this space. And I, I mean, school climate, we know is, is so important, um, almost goes hand in hand uh, with um, some of these efforts. Um, so we know both that, that bullying prevention programs can help to improve the school climate and that a more positive school climate is associated with um, reduced bullying and victimization. Um, we did a study recently, and it wasn't an intervention study, I should be clear about this, but we were looking at um, student perceptions of their teachers' use of um, social-emotional social learning techniques um, and found that the more that students perceived that their, their teachers were using this techniques, that related to reduced um, bullying overall in the schools and also personal victimization, um, but that was um, mediated or happening through, you know, their own um, their own social emotional learning skills. Um, in another study that we've done that's actually looking at um, child, child sexual abuse prevention using the second step child protection unit, um, we found that teacher outcomes in terms of increased um, competencies in this area uh, were mediated through um, their perceptions of school climate. So it was when those teachers that got the intervention um, in turn had more positive perceptions of the school climate, which then um, kind of produced the, the positive outcomes for them. So um, I think we have more and more evidence of just how how important school climate is, both in terms of an outcome and um, really a correlate of, of reduced bullying, victimization, and, and, and other problems in the school. Um, I just want to add something that even someone had mentioned in the Q&A chats, which is the principal in the schools. Uh, it puts a lot of pressure on them, but we have found that in order for any of this stuff to get off the ground at all, if you have a principal who's on board and really promoting this shift in culture, this shift in climate, and this importance of social emotional health, you can start seeing change. But without that person being on board, it is very difficult. It is more difficult to get the ball rolling and mm -hmm. to get teachers to even have the time to focus on it. So I would say if you're going to try uh, to even start to impact climate, I think there is a really important role of the principal in all of that. Thank you. Um, I'm looking at um, some of the questions that we've got that we've gotten looking at um, the bystander um, programming and defenders. And um, I think this is a question trying to get at um, as an individual in the school, how would how would one know in a particular situation that um, the stepping in the bystander defending behavior is effective? So I think I'm understanding this question correctly, and they're wondering, you know, um, if, the dis if the defending behavior, the bystanding behavior is effective, um, could one readily see a shift in the balance of power um, between the bullying perpetrator and the bullying victim? You, right. you, is that something that you've looked at, Amanda? Uh, we have not done sort of that. That sounds like a little bit more of the the work that um, that our colleagues in Canada have done, which is becoming a bit dated now. But they actually did observational studies of looking at this bystander intervention and then the immediate response. So did that stop the bullying? Um, we unfortunately have not um, have not been doing that work. Um, you know, it's although bullying is common, it's a relatively low base rate behavior. So, um, you know, doing the, that kind of observational study would be um, 
would be quite laborious but important. But from the perspective of a school staff member or teacher who may be observing, then yes, I think you can look at, you know, how those bystanders are responding and and what the reaction is. I mean, there's both the immediate reaction, does it stop it in the moment, but what we're really more concerned with is long term, does that sort of change the behavior, change the dynamic that's happening? And certainly checking in with the, the target, um, tr checking in with the, the peer group to, to see um, and monitor whether or not there's been change is, is another alternative to uh, just observing and, and seeing how that changes uh, in the moment. Thank you. Um, I have um, a, another question that we've gotten. I'm, I'm trying to think if anybody has submitted this one directly online, but I was asked this question at, at some point. Um, and it really, I think, also gets at this issue of climate and culture in the school um, and who's doing the bullying at school. So much of what we've talked about this afternoon relates to students engaging in bullying behavior or negative behavior. Um, but I'm wondering if you're able to speak to um, how schools might address bullying when it's others at the school who might be engaging in bullying or bullying-like behavior. Are either of the approaches that you all presented this afternoon um, effective at addressing others besides students who might be doing things that we um, don't want them to be doing at school that are bullying-like? Tracy, do you want to take that um, one? Yeah, I'm just thinking of how to frame it because I feel like while we have not tested that, uh, I think that if we are so focused on teaching our children social emotional skills, uh, realizing that this is a newer, newish phenomenon that none of us really received. So I think it would be helpful for teachers to get the same trainings on how to navigate their own stress and how to improve their own classroom management so these behaviors don't occur, so they're not likely to be reactful towards students. And I know in the book that uh, Dr. Bradshaw and I just wrote, part of it is about questioning your own biases as a teacher and as a staff member and how these things can impact your beliefs and how you're going to intervene if you yourself was a victim, if you yourself was a perpetrator, um, how that's going to impact how you're going to perceive bullying in your classroom. And I think that that kind of questioning and reflection is necessary. And I think if we could get some um, evidence-based PDs out there that help teachers to do this and help school staff, even um, staff members that are on the playground or on the recess and in, the, in, in school buses, to also be trained in these behaviors, they'll learn how to handle the stress. They'll learn how to handle conflict in a way that we're trying to train our children. And I think that that will be... Uh, but we have not been testing that yet. Um, and I, I would say that just anecdotally, in when I do professional development around these topics, I would say one of the most frequent questions that I get after I give the definition of bullying, because we use the CDC definition that StopBullying.gov uses as well, that talks about bullying being something that, that takes place between peers um, and in child childhood and adolescence, but I always get questions about can there be bullying in um, adulthood, um, and and more and more people are focusing on the behavior of of student of I'm sorry teachers administrators. Um, <laughs> other public figures in, in our society and, you know, what, what's being modeled. And, um, you know, a couple approaches, I think, uh, like Tracy said, there's starting to be more work in recognizing um, sort of uh, teacher stress and, and, and wellness and coping um, on the one hand, so how, how they are coping with things and how they are um, modeling behavior. Um, but from another perspective, I mean, that really also becomes a human resource issue. Um, if, a, if a teacher is either the victim of that or certainly the perpetrator toward students, then, you know, that's 
not how they should be behaving as a professional within their role. And um, and in in my experience, human resources is is really the the way to to go and intervene with those kinds of issues with teachers. Of course, we want to be preventive, and I I, I have, I'm hopeful that a lot of this you know professional development work and and even looking at the social emotional competencies and stress management of teachers um, will will start to have an effect as well. But you know when it comes down to it, that's that's just that's behavior that really um, you know needs to to have some some consequences behind it as well. I will also just add that some of the legislation, at least in New York State, um, also protects students under that law, our Dignity for All Students Act, um, against bullying, harassment, and intimidation, both from peers as well as from school staff members. I just want to put out there that um, there is some work that about anonymous reporting, and I think that in this instance when it could be a teacher and they might have power over you or it's your boss, um, it's, there should be an avenue through which you feel safe reporting it. and. Um, whether it be anonymous or privately, I think that schools should have that capability open for their students to be able to report bullying and bullying by teachers or other peers anonymously. Great, thank you. Um, so um, both of you have shared in your work some information on at least preliminary outcomes that you've seen over short periods of time. Um, Amanda, for example, I think you talked about kind of the next school year. Um, we got a question um, that, that is focused on potential long-term impacts of, of the work. Um, and um, they're wondering if, for example, with the, with the bystander research, um, is there any evidence that you're aware of either from your work or the work that others have do to support that students who are bystanders um, may become adults? who are bystanders. Is, is that something that we can answer now, or is that a research question that we might have to consider in the future? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I would say that is def that from what I know, that's something that would have to be answered in the future. Um, yes. There's definitely people that have been doing some great work on uh, long-term outcomes for perpetrators and most of the work has been done on victims or targets, um, but then also on perpetrators, but looking at those different participant roles and how that um, translates into adulthood outcomes and behaviors, I am not aware of any of that work at this time, but sounds exciting and something I'd like to, to certainly look at in the, in the longer term. Yeah, I, I agree with her answer. I think I think while there is a little bit of research longitudinally on bullying, I think um, getting funding for such research is often difficult. Um, following people over time is difficult. So all of these things are impediments to that. So then you often get like retrospective um, research, which is not inherently bad. It's just not the same as following people across time. But I'm hoping that um, with, the, with the focus and the public health concern for for bullying and related behaviors, we do get some more longitudinal data on this. Great, thank you. Um, we've got a number of questions that get at um, the issue of what populations of students um, these two um, programs may be effective with or you know, what they've been tested on. So sort of wondering about for both um, the, the classroom checkup and for the bystander interventions, <clears throat> Can you speak to the extent to which they might work um, with urban versus rural populations, public schools, special needs, um, kids of different ages? Is there something, are there things that you have learned um, in these two programs or perhaps generally about bullying prevention or intervention that we might need to think um, differently, to intervene differently with those populations? Or are there, are there some universal things that we can say about um, these particular interventions that they, um, that may be effective regardless of who is the recipient of um, the services? Well, I know my research, our research was done for the BCC was done in um, urban and urban fringe schools. So uh, if that answers that question directly, but um, indirectly, I know a lot of my other work done at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia focuses on urban schools as well. 
And we've just found that um, programs that are tailored to their specific needs, we have found great success with that. And uh, a lot of focus on reactive aggression and relational aggression within these environments has proven to be very, um, very effective. We've also found that um, in our environment in particular and possibly outside, there's a strong um, focus on the perpetrators for, for us and they are often thought of as having poor social skills or no social skills. And the truth is, is that we found that ours do have, in fact, a lot of leadership capabilities. So we couldn't just um, stamp out the perpetrator's behaviors without giving them another way to use that quote unquote skill that they have. So we've found that replacing um, their leadership for positive leadership has been, and this has also been found in, um, in Canada, there was some research uh, with some colleagues up there, um, they found the same thing, that by improving pro-social leadership. So I think that that might be the universal in that if we can replace these negative behaviors for people that are perpetrators with something positive and positive leadership, that might be one route. But in terms of um, specific focus, I think that schools will know. Um, I think that we have found that our schools know what issues they need to be addressed, and I think that that many of the programs do address the overarching same issues. And I think that the adaptations that occur are, have been found to be helpful for programming effectiveness. Yeah, and I would just add for bystander intervention, um, it, you know, although we're, we're seeing effects across the grade levels, uh, you know, third, sixth, and ninth grade, that um, the ninth graders, which may not be surprising, actually have, you know, higher skills uh, in this, this area to start with, so they also um, end with higher skills, uh, which is a little bit interesting because some of the previous work has actually found that younger students are more likely to defend, but as I mentioned from the meta-analytic findings, when we go to do interventions, they seem to be more effective at the high school level. Um, you know, I've started thinking about at the, the elementary and early middle school level that, that focusing on some of the more foundational social emotional skills, um, maybe the within you know a positive behavioral intervention and support framework um, may be the way to go. Whereas when we get more into adolescence, you know, teaching more um, specific skills about what to do when you encounter certain situations, a lot of the bystander intervention work has actually been applied in colleges and universities in um, in in training students to um, to identify and and prevent sexual assault. So what are the risky situations at the college and university level? So when I work with adolescents, I'll often talk to them about, you know, this may be something that you're exposed to if you go on um, to a college and university setting as well. So this is kind of a um, this is the worst way to say it, and I don't say it to them, but like a bigger kid, inter you know, a more adult sort of um, intervention, if you will. Um, most of our work, I'll have to say, has been done thus far in suburban and rural settings. Um, but I will say that similar to what, what Tracy was alluding to, um, I think one of the challenges that we've run into, I would say particularly in our rural settings, but also when I've done just more of this applied work rather than the actual research studies in urban schools, is the responses that people want to use in bullying situations are often aggressive. Um, so. And and I'll often hear from kids, well, my parents told me this as well, that, you know, if this is happening to me or I see this happening to a peer, then the best way to approach it is um, to be physically aggressive or else, you know, these other strategies are kind of aren't going to work. Um, so I, I will say that I, I think that continues to be um, – uh, fairly prevalent, at least in in the work that we that we've done with youth, and and something that is um, um, that is a challenge to counter. But particularly, perhaps in our more rur um, urban and rural settings. Um, thank you. Um, okay, I have um, a question here that relates. Um, this is to the bystander training, and I'm trying to make sure that I 
understand it. I think that this person is asking a question also reflecting on um, the BCCU so the, and looking at the coaching that came there. Um, and so this question is asking about um, the extent to which there is coaching support to the students who receive the bystander intervention training. So I, I think it's trying to get at this question of um, how to sort of help students apply what they yeah. might be learning. So I'm wondering if, Amanda, can you speak a little bit more in depth about um, what the training might look like and, and how, how students might learn to apply that? Training. Sure. Yeah, sure. So, you know, the training is a, uh, you know, currently about a five-hour training. Um, but at, with the NIJ grant, again, these, these peer um, brokers or, or lighthouse students, as they call them as well, also meet um, twice a month as a group and with a counselor. Um, and and directly sort of um, apply these skills to situations and how are we going to get this information out to others and have you used these skills and um, as I mentioned they also use a more um, curricular approach to that as well which also emphasizes um, the role of the bystander but looks at it also more cohesively from you know what to do if you're you're a victim um, I, I do think that a few future direction for us, um, and I'm sure this is going to come out with our development and innovation grant because we know that sort of a one-time training is only going to be um, so helpful, you know, so we give coaching in the role plays certainly during the training, but um, the more that that can be integrated throughout, you know, the daily experience and, and with check-ins and, and seeing how it's been applied to situations and having students problem solve that and practice that, uh, it, we know that that would lead to the most effective outcome. So I think that that, that needs to be um, taken into account more. Sounds like maybe some Teach Live training for them would help. <laughs> yes. We actually use Teach Live training. At, uh, we, do, we don't have it anymore, but um, I used it with my graduate students here. So it was fun to see Sean and CJ, you know, I'm trying to yes, kind of remember so the names the and things like that. But yeah, that that is um, that it could be was, adapted for that purpose. Exactly, yeah. exactly. I think it would be a great way to use that simulated reality with uh, with students. Yeah. Great. So more more crossover than um, than perhaps we thought at the outset. <laughs> So we've gotten a number of questions um, sort of at this related to definitions of bullying or understanding bullying or recognizing, recognizing bullying. Um, and I'm wondering um, if you can speak to the issue of how important you think it is for students to, or and teachers and, and others, to recognize something explicitly as bullying or is it just enough to recognize something as inappropriate um, behavior, something that we don't want um, folks to engage in? Well, I can speak for our intervention. We actually, I think I mentioned this, we actually train our teachers okay. to address all problems before they escalate because in order for it to become bullying, it's repeated. So the key is to stop it before it's repeated. Um, so then you have to be attuned to everything, if you will. But I think the key thing is to understand when there's conflict and how children are handling conflict. And I think that, that we all deal with conflict and we have to learn how to deal with conflict and there's, that, that is an appropriate part of childhood. And I think that that fine line between when it is not appropriate anymore um, needs to be clear. And I think that that's where you see the children who cannot come up with a solution to fix the problem. And that's not necessarily the full definition of bullying but that power differential is going to be a key piece to look out for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. It, it is important that we understand and, and recognize bullying as a distinct a form of aggressive behavior versus a conflict or something else. Um, and we as researchers spend a lot of time, yeah. you know, talking about the definition, debating about the definition. I, I actually, I've said this before, I think we're sometimes doing a disservice, though, to um, teachers and schools and parents by focusing 
too much on the repetition because as and even on the imbalance of power because as Tracy said um we want to stop it before it would escalate into that. So, you know, I, I'll often hear from parents that they've contacted schools and the schools will say, well, that's not bullying because bullying needs to be repeated. And I say to schools, okay, I, I understand that you, you know the definition and that's wonderful, but think about how that sounds to a parent. To to them, that sounds very um dismissive. So a better approach would be tell me what's happening and how we can problem solve to to work on that. So then it it does become more how do we work on this relationship? Um, How can we partner and problem solve versus when does it cross the line into um, this is bullying, we have to report, we have to, um, you know, do our investigation and which often unfortunately leads to a little bit more of a purely disciplinary or punitive response yeah. in my experience. So um, although it is important that that people understand bullying and how it is distinct, if we are, you know, boxing everything up so neatly into, well, this is something that we pay pay attention to and this is is not, then I I think we're really missing the boat and and perhaps not contributing to that positive school climate that's that's so important that we want. I've also noticed a bit of an exhaustion with the term. Like if, if the term everyone's bullying me, it's always bullying, I think people start shutting us out. Yeah. Like, um, and so I've noticed that too where they're just sick of hearing the term. And that's unfortunate because, um, it, it, you know, it's mean behavior, whatever you want to call it, mm-hmm. um, for in terms of the school needs to stop that kind of behavior. Yeah. Thank you, both of you. Thank you, both of you. Um, so I think we're, um, we've had a lot of questions coming in this afternoon. I think we've... Um, tackled um, themes of pretty much all of the questions that have come in. Um, I'm wondering if I can give, I'd like to give each of you sort of a moment to kind of um, reflect on our conversation today um, and think, you know, do you, is there, um, you know, is there a message that you kind of may perhaps want to reemphasize or or close out with this afternoon about um, your work to address bullying or what schools, you know, what, you know, perhaps what is the most important take takeaway that schools might think to apply? Um, so uh, Amanda or, or Tracy, whoever might want to stop first, what something you might want to emphasize or the most important takeaway message for folks this afternoon? Gosh, um, to summarize all of that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for me, it's it's really just that focus on this behavior being important and for all people, all adults in particular, to really focus on their own behavior as well as how they have a strong influence on what's going on around them, um, not just teaching them. And I know that there's a lot on their shoulders, but even as a parent, I know there's a lot on my shoulders, and um, I need to make that a priority, how my ch- child acts. And I think that if nothing else is taken away, it's that that this problem is important and it's important for all of us. Thank you. Yeah. And I I would say that a a theme that has run across for me both in both of the presentations and then I'm also looking at some of these great um, comments from participants is that, you know, taking this as an ongoing coaching and teaching approach for everyone involved, for the teachers, uh, for the the bystanders, for the the perpetrators, the targets, and we've talked some about the parents too. I think really um, recognizes this is an important issue. It's not an easy issue. If it were an easy issue to identify and do something about, then we would have already done it, and we we wouldn't we wouldn't be here today. Um, I'm seeing a lot of comments that are that are talking more about the the coaching and the helping teachers with um, kind of uh, self care, um, SEL counselors. You know, really sort of having more of that that coaching approach at every level, and um, I think that's where we have we have a lot of promise. Um, I I. Again, consequences and discipline are 
are important and, and needed in, in some respects, but this is not an issue that we're going to just kind of punish our way out of. So that continually attention to the relationship and to the skills um, for all involved is, is just critical. Yeah, I, I, I definitely am glad you said that. I think that the coaching aspect of both of our interventions has been really key, and I know that we've adapted to our programs um, here to, at CHOP to be coaching as well because we've realized that uh, merely giving them um, the box to do is not enough, and um, so I agree. I think that that's really key. Great. Thank you, both of you. Um, I mean, I've, my understanding and thinking about um, how to apply, you know, what you all have learned from your bullying prevention and intervention studies has certainly grown this afternoon, and I'm thinking about how what you've learned is really fitting into our, our larger portfolio of research and looking at bullying. So we have a number of other bullying studies at NIJ where we're trying to understand what is most effective, what are the best practices, how can this be applied in school settings, and how is that um, work helpful, not just at preventing um, or you know, reducing bullying at a school, but understanding some of these bigger implications that this work may have on school climate, on school culture, um, and ensuring um, that our schools are a safe place to be, a place that students want to be for learning. Um, and so, you know, the contributions that um, this bullying prevention intervention work can play to improving school safety, um, is, I think, is, is really important work. And so I really appreciate um, your conversations and your contributions um, to this research and helping to think about how schools can apply this work um, and perhaps um, shift what they're doing um, a little bit to do, to do things a little bit differently in a way that might be more successful um, for, their, for their school settings. So I thank both of you um, for participating. Um, is there, are there any sort of closeouts? Um, I think I'll, I'll just reiterate. So um, this, the presentations this afternoon um, have been recorded. And if you have colleagues in your offices or others um, that you come into contact with that want to access um, this afternoon's webinar, it should be available in a couple of weeks on the NIJ website. So I encourage you to come back um, and look for that shortly. Um, and also to continue to be on the lookout for um, subsequent um, information that comes out from NIJ about what we're learning about to prevent and reduce bullying and about school safety, um, other, other school safety issues. So thank you both of you and to everyone on the phone. Thank you. Thank you.